Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, the other day I was dealing with Nathan Oakley on his channel and I had to deal with about an hour or an hour and a half of him shouting, where did you get R in a situation where we weren't using the radius of the earth? I put up with that and I've already addressed that several times, but there was something good that came out of that visit to his channel. And that is with Brian's logic. Because Brian demonstrated a very common problem with the science denial community, and that is something called dyscalculia. Dyscalculia is the inability to visualize geometric structures in your head and understand things in three dimensions. Now, to give you an example, in the background, you see some shapes. Even though these shapes are on a computer monitor and are clearly two-dimensional, most of us can look at the shapes and realize that a cone is a three-dimensional object or a sphere is a three-dimensional object. We can cut a sphere in half and notice that it forms a circle. This seems to be a problem in the science denial community. For example, here is one of my son's baseballs. Now, I think that everybody can look at this baseball and understand that this is a three-dimensional object. When I rotate it or move it in any direction, what do you see? You literally see a two-dimensional circle, but you know that this is not a two-dimensional object because you know the center part of the baseball is closer to you than the edge of the baseball. Yet, if you look at the edge of the baseball, you can visualize in your head that that would form a circle or a circumference around the edge of the baseball. Now, this is a problem that they seem to be baffled with when it comes to circles of equal altitude. Now, the entire point of a circle of equal altitude is that if you were to look at this baseball, you can imagine that this forms a circle or a circumference around the baseball. That circle will, of course, have a diameter, which is the same diameter as the baseball. Actually, it'll be a little bit less due to parallax. However, that distance from the point closest to the camera on the baseball down to the very edge that you can see is not the radius of that circle. The radius of the circle is half the diameter of the circle. You see there's a difference. This is a key concept to understanding circles of equal altitude. So let's go ahead and cue up the music and then we're gonna have Brian's logic explain the flat earth understanding of what a circle of equal altitude is. Then what we'll do is we'll see where he went wrong in his thought process and we'll give you the correct information. So let's cue up the music and get going. Okay, so before we get on to Brian and Nathan Oakley, let's go ahead and go over the basic operation of a sextant. Now, when most people talk about a sextant, what they think about is a marine sextant, and this is a, a Davis Mark 25 marine sextant. Now, this is a little telescope. Normally, you would look through it like this. I'm just bringing it around so you can see it a little better. So you look through this telescope, through this mirror, which is called the horizon mirror because you're looking through the telescope out towards the horizon. Now this is a partially silvered mirror. Some are silvered on one side and clear on the other. This one's partially silvered throughout the entire mirror, so you can look through any part of it. Now, up here we have what's called the index mirror, and it is attached to the index arm. Now the way that you operate the sextant is you start off by looking up at a celestial object, perhaps the sun. So you're looking up. Then you pinch the index arm right here, and as you bring the sextant down to look at the horizon, you maintain this mirror so that the sun is reflected through this index mirror onto the horizon mirror and back to the telescope. Now what'll happen is, is you'll bring the sun down to the horizon until the very lower limb of the sun, the bottom edge of the sun, is just touching the horizon. And then what you do is you rock it back and forth a little bit 
to make sure that you are at the bottom of the swing so that the sun is literally just touching the horizon. And then you read off your angle. Now, that should bring an immediate problem to your head when it comes to dealing with a flat Earth. Well, what horizon are you looking at? You're looking at the horizon that you see, the apparent horizon. And what about refraction and blah, blah, and what about, what about, what about? We have instrument error with the sexton itself. It may be slightly out of calibration. That's called an index error, and that's built into the sexton. You simply have to correct for that. Much like if your speedometer was reading five miles an hour too fast, you know that you have to make a correction for that to get your true speed. Well, the same thing with the sextant. Next, we have to take into account the distance we are above the surface of the water. If you're elevated off the surface of the water, you have to look down to the horizon. There's a specific angle that we can look up in the Naval Almanac to correct for that. Then we also have to do a correction for refraction. Now, this correction for refraction, we look up directly in the Naval Almanac, and it has to do with the altitude of the celestial object that you're looking at. Now, when I did my sextant reading in my driveway, the altitude of the sun was approximately 47 degrees. So if you go over here to where it says 47 degrees, you'll see that my correction for refraction is about 0.8 minutes. Now, that translates to 8 tenths of a mile on the ground. Now, interestingly enough, so long as your altitude to the object is 40 degrees or more, if you don't correct for refraction at all, you'll only be one nautical mile off or less. It's only when you get down into the 10, 15, 20 degrees that you have an error as much as three and a quarter miles, perhaps. It's not that much. It's just a little correction that we make to improve the accuracy of our reading. We are expected as amateurs to be able to find our position on Earth within about 15 nautical miles with the use of a sextant. I can regularly get it down below 5 miles. That's pretty good. Now we've just demonstrated that the refraction with the sextant reading is not that big of a deal. But there's still the objection to dealing with a horizon because you have to deal with dip corrections and you have to deal with a refracted versus an apparent versus a terrestrial versus a geometric horizon. There's a way to get around that. Let's not use the horizon at all. Let's just go ahead and establish a vertical. And establishing a vertical is actually quite simple. We can do it with a level all the time. This is a bubble level and with it we can establish a vertical. Using the same principle, we have a device like this. This is a Link A-12 aircraft sextant from World War II. In here is a bubble chamber that's filled with xylene and has a very small air bubble in it. Now by holding this sextant at a particular angle, we can get that bubble in the center of the bubble chamber. By adjusting our index mirror, which is right here, we can bring the reflection of the sun down so that the sun sits in the middle of that bubble. What we have established with the bubble is a vertical. The sextant itself will then take that vertical and in combination with the index mirror, create a horizontal from it, and then it will measure the angle from that horizontal to our celestial object. We don't use the horizon at all. As you see by 90 degrees right here, refraction has no effect on the vertical. The sextant itself creates the horizontal perpendicular to that vertical, so no horizon is used at all. So let's go over how things work on a spherical Earth. Here's the center of the Earth. Here's us at that point on the Earth right there. This is a line directly from the center of the Earth to our vertical overhead, which is 90 degrees. And that, therefore, would be a right angle there. Now, they say that you can't get a right angle to the curve. That's not true, and we'll see why in a moment. Let's go ahead and take a line right here. That is a line that is perpendicular to the vertical line. That's a right angle right there. Now with the A12 sextant, what we're doing is we're establishing this vertical line. 
the sextant itself draws this perpendicular line to it. This is our horizontal. So how do we measure an angle? Well, we have a vertical. That's a straight line. It draws a straight line perpendicular to it as our horizontal. That's just something the sextant does. That's the way it's designed to work. Then we do our observation, and we see the celestial object out in that direction. This is our altitude, our sextant angle, because we're measuring that angle directly off the sextant, and the angle is between the horizontal of the sextant and our star. Is this a straight line? Yes, by definition because there's no refraction at the zenith. Is this horizontal a straight line? Yes, by definition, because it's designed that way in the sextant. That is a line at a 90 degree angle to the vertical. And the bubble in the sextant determines what the vertical is. There's no horizon involved at all. Now there is a way to use the marine sextant and do something very similar to this called using an artificial horizon, and I've got a video on that. If you want more information on that, I'll put a link to the video in the description. So the entire argument about what about the horizon and what horizon are we looking at with the A12 bubble sextant is a moot argument because there's no horizon involved. So we'll discard all of those objections because they're not relevant, and we'll move on. Now, when I got started on this series, there was a lot of information that I wanted to go over. I wanted to counter each and every one of the flat earth arguments against the sextant, because the sextant and celestial navigation is quite a problem for them. Now, they've come up with a variety of excuses, and I want to go through them one at a time. So tomorrow, we're going to go over a video that was put out by Nathan and Brian that outlines a lot of these excuses, and we're going to hit them one after another but I wanted to get this very basic information out of the way first. So we'll start that tomorrow. In the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe. I'll see you again tomorrow and we'll keep hitting this until it's done. Take care guys.